Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, today's class, very important class, parental and algesics and infusions. Uh, this class will be taken by Dr. Vashi. Vashi is our third year MD palliative medicine student. Very sincere, hardworking. Take a lot of interest in patient care and see everything very minutely when she is on the patient's bedside. Uh, this uh, this uh, session will be moderated by Dr. Balbir. Balbir is our assistant professor at National Cancer Institute, Jhajar, uh, and IRCH. He is, again, a very sincere and hardworking faculty of my team. He has done a fellowship in chronic pain from Canada. He, has, he, did, he, he is doing a lot of good uh, uh, research. And one of his, of his research was awarded in a, a Boston conference, IASP World Pain Conference. And he got the uh, full scholarship for to attend that conference to, uh, in Boston last, last to last year. So I, I'm, I'm very, very sure that both of them have, must have uh, prepared this class uh, very well. And uh, all your comments and questions you can write down in the chat box or otherwise you can uh, discuss at the end. Thank you, Vashi. You can start. Thank you, ma'am, for the introduction. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I am a third year junior resident at Ames. Uh, my class is moderated by uh, Dr. Malbir, sir. Uh, thank you. Uh, so today I'll be presenting my seminar on the topic, parental analgesics and infusions. Now, the contents of my seminar include analgesic infusion preparations, uh, focusing on IV preparations, syringe driver preparations, syringe driver compatibility and interactions, how to manage a patient on a syringe driver, and briefly on drugs used in epidural and intrathecal analgesia. So we all know parental administration of drugs includes subcutaneous, intravenous, intramuscular, and intradermal routes. Here we inject the drug directly into the tissue fluid or blood without having to cross the enteral mucosa. Therefore, the drug action is faster, the liver is bypassed, gastric irritation and vomiting are not provoked, and there is no interference by food or digestive juices and we can administer it to an unconscious, uncooperative, or a patient who is vomiting. So before starting any uh, IV infusion, we must uh, know the, we must be aware of the general safety checks. This is a CATSPUR is a mnemonic device to teach safety checks for administering IV medication. C stands for compatibilities. Is the drug compatible with the fluid? This will be, be discussed with the syringe driver preparations. A stands for allergies. Does the patient have any drug allergies? Tubing, is the tu correct tubing to use? S stands for site. Is the site safe? Is there any sign of local infection? Is there phlebitis, etc.? E stands for pump. The four P's of pump safety include, is the pump programmed precisely? Is the pump correct for this drug? Is the pumping mechanism working? Are the alarms working? Is the pump plugged in? So it is recommended that you always use a plugged in. So we have to check whether the pump is, is not running on batteries. The first R stands for rate. Is the rate correct? Second R stands for release. Check if all the clamps are released. R, the third R stands for return and reassess. How did the patient tolerate the drug? Is the drug helping? And we must remember the chart of findings. How do we prepare a setup? So uh, it is usually prepared in accordance with the Institute medication policy. The syringe must be labeled clearly with blue IV additives label. An infusion pump must be used for all opioid infusions and programmed using guardrails. At IRCH, these are the two pumps uh, as seen in the uh, photos. First one is the WIT301A pump. The second one is the Injectomat Agile syringe pump that we use in IRCH. So basically, uh, different institutes will have different uh, branded pumps. So, uh, but the basic structure of the pump is the same. It consists of an on-off button where to start and stop the a button for starting and stopping the infusion. 
uh, arrows or plus and minus buttons for increasing or decreasing the rate, the, uh, the doses. Then we have a bolus button, a menu, uh, then uh, a button to set the particular rates or particular doses. The syringe and lines should be changed every 72 hours or more, depending upon the individual unit policy or the patient's medical condition. And it's not always necessary to use a three-way tap. Three bolus doses of opioid infusion should only be administered using the bolus button on the syringe pump. So for opioid infusions, first we must administer a loading dose at the commencement of the infusion in order to ensure a therapeutic plasma that therapeutic plasma levels are quickly reached. For rapid relief of pain, the prescribed bolus dose should be administered and the infusion may, rate may be adjusted according to the patient's level of pain. What about concurrent drugs? When opioid infusions are used, uh, no oral IV opioids or sedative agents should be given without prior consultation with a senior specialist. Uh, paracetamol, ketamine, local anesthetics, and NSAIDs may be prescribed and administered concurrently with opioid infusions. This helps to reduce the opioid requirements and the associated side effects. So the common parental analgesics which we all use in our wards include paracetamol, diclofenac, ketorolac. Briefly, uh, the opioid analgesic infusions uh, that we use are fentanyl, uh, the onset after IV bolus, uh, onset of action starts in one to two minutes, half-life is two to four minutes, and this, these, these are the dosages. The dosages, uh, I will not be explaining because they have been discussed pre in the previous uh, classes before. Second, morphine, uh, it, onset of action is five to 10 minutes, and the half-life is three to four years, uh, three to four hours. The, the other opiate analgesic that we use uh, tr is tramadol. So tramadol, it comes in a formulation, uh, so it comes in ampule, one ampule that we use in our ward is 2 ml, 2 ml, uh, which has uh, 100 mg. So uh, according to the patient's requirements, 50 to 100 mg, 4 or 6 hourly is given. The non opioid analgesic infusions uh, that are used, uh, sometimes we use ketamine. So the T half is about, uh, the half life is about two and a half to three and a half hours. Alpha 2 agonists like clonidine and dexmedetomidine are also being used. Now, uh, in this article, in this review paper, uh, by Jalanta titled Subcutaneous and IV Administration of Analgesics in Palliative Medicine. Uh, here, uh, they have discussed that uh, alternative routes of administration of medicines, especially in palliative medicine, involve multiple injections or continuous infusions, both subcutaneous and IV. And they found that there are no significant differences between the subcutaneous and IV application of medicines in terms of their absorption, efficacy, and frequency of side effects. In this uh, <coughs> European Journal of Hospital Pharmacy uh, article, whereby they interviewed healthcare prof uh, where, where they, uh, they, they took healthcare professionals' views and experiences on practices of preparing morphine infusions for analgesia in one UK pediatric hospital. And they found that there is no uh, strict protocol as how to prepare morphine infusion. A variety of approaches have been used even in one single hospital. And there is a lack of appreciation of the excess volume which is present in morphine ampules that, nom that nominally contain one or two ml, uh, uh, which was identified. And the other source of, uh, sources of error were miscalculation, complexity of the multi-step procedure, distractions, and time pressure. So they concluded that ready-to-use pre-filled syringes and pre-programmed syringe pumps would improve the practice and minimize the risk of error. So uh, coming to syringe drivers in palliative care, what is a syringe driver? It is a small portable battery powered infusion device that is suitable for patient use in the hospital as well as at home to provide continuous subcutaneous infusion of drugs from a syringe. So we can provide analgesics, antiemetics, sedatives, or anticholinergics, etc., using a syringe driver. The syringe is drawn up with a single drug or a combination of drugs, and it is administered at a constant rate over a set period, which is usually 24 hours. What are the indications for use? Uh, persistent nausea and vomiting, poor alimentary absorption, patient refusing to take medications orally, dysphagia, sleep, sleepiness or coma, malignant bowel obstruction, which is not, who is not suitable for surgery, and in cases of intractable pain. 
There are certain advantages and disadvantages of using a syringe driver. Advantages include effective symptom control due to steady plasma con drug concentrations, management of multiple symptoms using combination of medicines. Uh, the, it is only one single route of administration. It is simpler and less invasive than IM and IV injections. Mobile patients can remain so, enabling more independence, which is very important. The disadvantages are the medicine requirements must be anticipated for a 24-hour period, resulting in loss of flexibility in dosing. Medicines given by other routes may be required to manage the symptoms for the initial four hours of the subcute infusion uh, till the medicines reach an optimal plasma concentration. Now, uh, the, the, another disadvantage is when uh, the patient, when the symptoms would require SOS doses. Uh, the next uh, disadvantages would be the local reactions. If we do not choose a uh, site properly, then it increases the chances of inflammation, infection, and pain, etc. And patients may consider it as a final step before death and find, find its use disconcerting and, obst and obstrusive. So what are the considerations that must be taken before starting an infusion? Uh, we must know the patient's medicine requirements for 24 hours the doses that may be required for breakthrough symptoms, the choice of diluent, the compatibility of the medicines required to manage the symptoms. In general, we should avoid more than three medicines in one syringe. Coming to the selection, preparation, and maintenance of the site. How do you select a site? You use an area, use, always use an area with a good depth of subcutaneous fat. Use, use a site that is not near a joint and select a site that is easily accessible, such as the chest and the abdomen. The site selection will be influenced by whether the patient is ambulatory, agitated, or distressed. For example, in agitated patients, in delirious patients, we, we choose a, a upper back site. The inappropriate site selection includes lymphadenitis areas, broken skin, irradiated areas, sites of infection, bony prominences, near a joint, sites of tumor, skin folds, and or scarred skin. Site preparation, as we all know, aseptic technique must be followed. And in consultation with the patient and the family, we select a suitable site. You select and use sites on a rotating basis, and the point of cannula should be inserted just beneath the epidermis. So we all know subcute injection, we, uh, we inserted uh, the needles inserted at uh, 45 degrees, but in very thin people. So the angle of the cannula on insertion may need to be less, for example, uh, 30, less than 45 degrees. Uh, and, and a deeper infusion may prolong the life of the infusion site. Insert as seen in the photos, you grasp the skin firmly to elevate the subcutaneous tissue. You insert the cannula, then you release the skin. When the tubing is placed, always try to form a loop to prevent dislodgement. And then you use a tegaderm to cover the um, to cover the cannula. Then you connect the syringe to the syringe driver. The extension tubing is then changed when the cannula is changed. Side inspection. Any side problem cause pain. Uh, cause patient discomfort and interferes with the drug ab absorption and compromise effective symptom control. The site should be inspected regularly. Four hourly, four hourly is generally recommended uh, or sometimes even more frequently to identify early and reduce the risk of site-related complications. We can look for tenderness at the site, presence of a hematoma, leaking at the insertion site, blood in the tubing, cannula displacement, etc. Now, uh, diluents. What is the purpose? Uh, the purpose of diluents is to enable drug delivery over a prescribed time and reduce site irritation. The diluent should be compatible with the drugs in the syringe. Uh, palliative care formulary and uh, almost uh, uh, all the uh, published, uh, all the uh, uh, recommendations from uh, uh, known guidelines rec uh, recommend water for injection as a standard diluent of choice. Then 0.9% normal saline can be considered if the potential actual, if there is potential or actual problem with inflammatory reactions at the injection site. In the US, acidic 5% glucose in water is used as a first sign diluent. So in such cases, uh, we must avoid basic drugs such as dexamethasone, ketamine, hydromorphone, ketorolac. Why? Because it will cause precipitation as soon as the drugs are mixed. 
comparison of diluents. The advantages of water for injection are uh, there is less chance of incompatibility. Generally, more compatibility data is available for the commonly used drugs. So it has been mentioned that uh, water for injection uh, can be used as a diluent in almost all of the uh, palliative, commonly used palliative care drugs. The disadvantages, however, uh, include uh, is as follows. Large volumes are hypotonic which may cause infusion site pain or skin reaction. 0.9, a normal saline is isotonic. So the advantages is that it is preferable for diluting irritant drugs. Therefore, it causes less infusion site reaction. However, the disadvantage is that it is incompatible with some drugs, example, cyclizine, uh, and higher concentrations of diamorphine, more than 40 mg per ml, or higher concentrations of haloperidol, more than 1 mg per ml. And generally, less compatibility data is available for commonly used drugs. Coming to infusion volume, uh, certain factors influence the final volume of the uh, continuous sub, uh, subcute infusion. That is the total volume of the drugs, what is the de infusion device used, the maximum rate of delivery, the intended infusion time, and the prevailing local guidelines. Greater dilution is uh, recommended. Why? Because it reduces the risk of incompatibility. It reduces the impact of priming a line that is uh, less drug in the dead space, and it reduces the injection side skin reactions from the drug. Coming to infusion duration, CSI uh, syringes are generally timed to empty over 24 hours. What are the main reasons for this? Uh, this has been uh, because of extrapolation of sterility guidelines from continuous IV infusions, uh, because of availability of stability and compatibility data, uh, for standardization of practice, basically for safety reasons, and uh, because of tradition based on limitations of the older syringe drivers. Stability, what do we mean by uh, stability and uh, compatibility? Stability describes how much the drug remains in its original form in a given period. And compatibility describes whether the addition of a diluent or a drug causes a reaction, be it physical or chemical. So various factors affect drug stability or compatibility, such as the diluent, as we've just discussed, the final concentration of drug in the solution, the order of mixing, and the brand formulation or strength of the drug. Uh, this differs between brands, this differs between countries, What is the uh, and the duration of infusion, and lastly, absor adsorption onto the delivery system material. Coming to drug compatibility, when do we say a drug is physically compatible? Uh, mixing two or more drugs does not when mixing two or more drugs does not result in a physical change. Example: discoloration, clouding, or crystallization. Chemical compatibility is. Uh, is when mixing two or more drugs does not result in a chemical change, which leads to loss or degradation of the drug. Third is observational data. Data from many uh, palliative care centers about visual appearance of various drug mixtures over infusion period of 24 hours have been collated. It is subjective, imprecise, and only major incompatibilities have been identified. Fourth is lab data. It is derived from microscopic examination of a drug mixture under polarized light at specified concentrations. So the general principles of compatibility are as follows. Drugs with a similar pH are more likely to be compatible, which is very important. Most drugs are acidic in solution, except as I've previously mentioned, dexamethasone, diclofenac, uh, furosemide, Ketorolac or meprazole phenobarbital. So uh, acidic and basic drugs should not be mixed. Then third, we must dilute it to the maximum volume possible in order to uh, reduce the incidence of uh, reactions. We must protect from direct sunlight and heat. And uh, it is preferable to add not more than three drugs in one syringe. So more drugs, the more chances of incompatibility. And uh, initial cloudiness may resolve on full mixing. Compatibility with, uh, now it must be noted that compatibility with cyclizine and haloperidol is concentration dependent. And the risk of precipitation of dexamethasone, it is noted that the risk of precipitation of dexamethasone is reduced if it is added last to an already diluted drug mixture. 
these are the drugs uh, this is a table which has been uh, which i've taken from the uh, palliative care formulary showing uh, the different drugs and different breeds so from just looking at this also we'll have a rough idea of which drugs are, com are compatible and also basically the principle is not to add and not to mix uh, basic drugs and acidic drugs Irritant subcutaneous drugs, uh, the drugs which are strongly irritant and which we should not give by uh, continuous subcutaneous infusions are chlorpromazine, uh, diazepam, and prochlorperazine. Relatively irritant precautions necessary include cyclazine, diclofenac, ketorolac, ketamine, methadone, octreotide, or dancetron, phenobarbital, promethazine, and liver, uh, liver mepromazine. Now, this chart and the charts in the subsequent slides uh, have been extra have been taken from the palliative care formulary. Uh, formulary. So uh, this uh, is a compatibility a compatibility chart for two drugs in water for injection. Similarly, in the other slides, we have a compatibility chart for drugs in normal saline. Now, to the right on the right side, we have the general key for the charts in which a red box means do not use. It means that it's not compatible. Yellow is used with caution. Now the boxes where the A, B, and C and letters are written uh, show uh, these A, B, C would be in the next slide. These are the footnotes. So uh, A, uh, A, now this box shows uh, if uh, the drugs intersection of the, uh, if we take the, the drugs horizontally and uh, horizontally and vertically the point of intersection that is the box at which they intersect if it shows a b and c it means some some report some reports of incompatibility have been uh, are present now the green box denotes uh, reported compatible question mark is there is no data uh, and gray is generally not recommended or not applicable so for example uh, it is not possible to remember all the drugs so we will we'll just have a we must refer to the charts uh, as when required now for example let us look at the uh, first uh, let us look at uh, if you can follow my uh, uh, follow the arrow let us look at morphine sulfate now morphine sulfate uh, <coughs> horizontally now it is uh, now there are more green boxes that means the morphine sulfate is compatible with uh, almost uh, almost all of uh, with uh, quite a number of a handful of these drugs for example morphine sulfate if look at the second box for, uh, going on the horizontal line and then uh, and if you take this box if you follow this if you follow my uh, cursor then if you go up we have metocropamide and the point of the box of intersection between metocropamide uh, vertically and morphine sulfate horizontally is a green box which means that these two can be uh, mixed together that means it is compatible now if you look at the first box that is morphine sulfate and midazolam m now in this box it is yellow that means it must be used with caution and there is a letter m written so if you look at the footnotes here m morphine uh, if you read at this if you read this diamorphine or morphine sulfate plus midazolam is generally regarded as compatible but it is uh, now the letter m there is a footnote because there is one a study which has reported incompatibility for diamorphine similarly for all the drugs this chart will give an idea which drugs are compatible and which are not this is a compatibility chart for morphine sulfate for three drugs in water for injection. Uh, this is uh, for non-opioids. This is a compatibility chart for two drugs in 0.9% uh, normal saline, uh, following the same principles, the general key charts and the footnotes. This is the uh, chart for three drugs in normal saline, for, uh, including morphine sulfate. And this is uh, for three drugs in normal saline for non-opioids. So uh, how do we manage a patient on a syringe driver? A patient and family education is uh, very important. Now, for example, uh, they may have uh, certain questions. They will have will have questions. So uh, they have. So if they ask about carrying the infusion device, uh, uh, they we must. Uh, so uh, what happens is this. Uh, the syringe driver is quite it's portable it is small in size so it the syringe drivers that come will uh, have you can um, use the syringe uh, 
total uh, volume of about 10 ml. So uh, we must tell them that uh, you can, uh, when they want to go uh, for uh, portability, we, they, can use a, they can use a belt bag to conceal and carry the device discreetly. And uh, we must advise that they do not cover the pump with blankets or pillows as this may cause overheating and uh, may uh, cause an impact on safe functioning. Now, uh, queries regarding showering. Infusion devices must not be immersed in water because they may be damaged by steam. Uh, the pus, steam and water. The person in care should be given clear written instructions about disconnection from uh, disconnection from and reconnection to the infusion device for the purpose of showering. And we must uh, emphasize that the period of disconnection uh, should be as brief as possible. Coming to the query of breakthrough of pain or unreduced symptoms, the person and carer should be reassured that if the person continues to experience some pain or other symptoms, breakthrough medication can be given on these occasions. Now, uh, questions regarding alarms. The infusion devices generally will alarm if the reservoir is empty or if there's a blockage or there's air in the tubing, the, then we must instruct the person or the care not to panic. We must provide details on how to contact the relevant uh, health healthcare professional. Information, we must also provide information about the device. Uh, in certain uh, infusion pumps, a green light will flash intermittently above the on-off button and, uh, and or the pump delivering animation at the bottom of the display when the pump, pump is functioning correctly. Uh, a flashing light on, uh, with regards to the CAD infusion pumps, a flashing light on the LCD screen indicates a normal operating mode. We must always instruct the person or the family to have a spare battery available. We must encourage the person or family to check the device to ensure it is working normally, but encourage them not to worry about checking it overnight. And always provide written troubleshooting guidelines for the person and the carrier. Now, uh, what should you do when the person or family believes there is something wrong with the infusion device or the alarm sounds? We must tell them to check, uh, we must always check, is the person experiencing increase of pain or other symptoms, uh, indicating infusion not working? Is there an occlusion? Is there a kink in the tubing? Then we must untwist it. When there is sufficient charge to complete the current program, ch uh, uh, change the battery, then hold down on or off button until the beep indicates indicates turn on and press yes to confirm and restart the program. So uh, what happens if the syringe is empty and the cannula has come, come out? We must instruct the person and the family carrier to contact their healthcare provider as soon as possible. And what happens if the cannula site is swollen or painful? Then you give always uh, provide breakthrough medication as needed if the person is experiencing pain or another symptom. And uh, in the end, uh, we must always provide information and contact details of the healthcare provider. So, um, an RCT was uh, done to explore differences in lay care's confidence in administering subcutaneous injections depending upon whether a lay carer, a registered nurse, or a pharmacist prepared injections for subsequent administration by lay carers. And uh, they concluded that upskilled lay carers can confidently administer subcutaneous injections for loved ones, regardless of who prepares the injections. This, in, can, this finding can improve the patient outcomes and potentially decrease unwanted admissions to inpatient facilities. So it is necessary, it is of utmost importance that we empower the caregivers that we teach them about how the device functions, what to do in case uh, of any, um, if anything goes wrong, if the device stops working, etc. We must always provide to the uh, a brochure or a troubleshooting guidelines in case such an event occurs.
This uh, article also was done, uh, this study was done to, uh, to investigate the effects, adverse effects of sub uh, continuous subcutaneous uh, infusions for pain control in dying patients with particular interest in methadone use. And they concluded that uh, it is an effective way to reduce pain in dying patients without increasing the adverse effects. And also add on methadone may be beneficial in patients with severe complex pain. Coming to the last topic, uh, drugs used in epidural and intrathecal analgesia. So uh, what is the epidural analgesia? Here the drugs are delivered into the epidural space and they've diffused through the meninges to reach the spinal cord and the adjacent nerve roots. The level of the spinal cord at which the catheter is sited is, influ is influ uh, influences the area over which the maximal analgesia is obtained. Higher doses are required compared to intrathecal drug administration. Whereas the intrathecal route delivers the drug directly into the CSF, and the area of analgesia is less dependent on the side of the catheter because the drugs in the CSF automatically diffuse rostrally. And compared to epidural, intrathecal uh, injections require lower doses, thereby permitting the use of smaller devices and or reducing the frequency of refilling. When do we use Muraxel analgesia? It is commonly used for obstetric or perioperative pain relief. In the palliative care settings, only 2 to 4 percent proceed to spinal analgesia due to unsatisfactory pain relief. It is found that it is effective in more than 50% of the patients. So what are the indications? Mm, systemic opioid intolerance. Either there is decreased uh, opioid efficacy or there is increased uh, toxicity. Uh, in, it is used, indicated in refractory neuropathic pain and refractory nociceptive pain. What are the contraindications? Uh, it should not be given in cases of uncorrected coagulopathies systemic or local infection, raised ICPs. And extra caution should be used in spinal deformities, incipient spinal cord compression, myelosuppressive chemotherapy, and intracranial metastasis. So uh, we shall be discussing only a select, uh, only select drugs, uh, opioids. Now, the morphine and diamorphine are the most commonly opioid drugs which are used. Hydromorphone, fentanyl, methadone, and buprenorphine are also used. They act, opioids act locally and or in the brainstem, which occurs through CSF diffusion and or systemic redistribution. And it is found that advantages of spinal administration are greatest with hydrophilic opioids. Example, morphine and hydromorphine, they penetrate the spine effectively and are slowly redistributed, thereby giving a total duration of action of about 12 to 24 hours. Fentanyl is not preferred in universal analgesia. Why? Because it's of lipophilic nature. It is quickly uh, syst systematically uh, redistributed. So the duration of action onset is faster and the duration of action is less, uh, lesser. Most centers have their own conversion tables based on oral morphine equivalent dose in MG per 24 hours, which is converted to the epidural or the intrathecal, intrathecal uh, dose. So uh, the spinal cord selectivity of neuraxal opioids uh, in the treatment of acute post-operative pain is the highest with morphine, heroin, and hydromorphone. It is moderate with fentanyl, sufentanyl, so and methadone, and it is lowest with alfentanyl, meperidine, and buprenorphine. Uh, this article describes uh, the dosages for uh, intraepidural and intrathecal uh, morphine uh, in post for post-op analgesia. The recommended dosage for epidural morphine, uh, morphine sulfate alone or with a local anesthetic uh, is a bolus dose of 30 to 100 mics per kg, infusion of 0.2 to 0.4 mg per hour. It has a total duration of action of 12 to 24 hours. In case of extended release morphine, Alone or without a uh, local anesthetic, it should be given only at the lumbar level. The dosage is a bolus of 5 to 15 mg and it has a duration of action of up to 48 hours. The recommended 
intrathecal morphine dosages for failed surgeries include at low uh, low dosages for uh, associated to local or regional anesthesia would be uh, ranging from 50 to 200 micrograms for moderate dose associated to general anesthesia we have 200 to 400 micrograms and high dose associated general anesthesia include 500 uh, up to five uh, more than 500 grams, uh, micrograms now in the simplest conversion would be a 24 hour epidural infusion dose would be just that would be 10 percent of the 24 hour oral dose for example a, a person is requiring 30 mg oral morphine in 24 hours so the epidural dose would be 3 mg in 24 hours similarly a 24 hour intrathecal infusion dose would be one percent of the 24 hour oral dose Coming to local anesthetics, uh, bupivacaine is the most white, is the most commonly used local anesthetic for spinal analgesia. It also has inherent bactericidal properties. With judicious use of low dose bupivacaine, that is 0.1%, it is usually possible to get good pain relief without significant impairment of the sensory or motor function. And large volumes are not always needed. And for some patients, 5 to 8 ml of 0.5% uh, bupivacaine given epidurally over a 24 hour period will provide analgesia with no motor block. So usually 0.5 to uh, 2 mg is uh, sufficient to, prov uh, to provide adequate uh, uh, pain relief. The undesirable side effects include hypotension, dose-dependent motor and sensory impairment generally at more than 50 mg per day. And the other local anesthetics used include liver bupivacaine, ropivacaine, etc. Coming to alpha adrenergic receptor agonist, clonidine. Clonidine is generally given along with an opiate and a local anesthetic. It is seen, the benefit is seen particularly in neuropathic pain. The analgesic effect is mediated by uh, effect at the alpha 2 receptors, resulting in the peripheral or central suppression of sympathetic transmitter release, inhibition of nociceptive afferents, and postsynaptic inhibition of the spinal neurons. The undesirable side effects include dose dependent hypotension, bradycardia, abrupt cessation. Uh, and abrupt cessation, example, pump failure, may cause severe rebound hypertension. The other side effect is sedation. Now, the epidural regimen would be first a test bolus dose of 50 to 150 micrograms in 5 ml of normal saline over 5 minutes. If there is relief, then uh, we can start infusion at 150 to 300 micrograms per day, depending upon the, pain, uh, the severity of the pain. The intrathecal regimen would be a test bolus dose of 50 micrograms in 5 ml, 0.9 in, uh, in 5 ml normal saline over 5 minutes. If there is relief, then we can start infusion. Uh, we can start infusion. Infusion dose would be 50 to 1, uh, 150 micrograms per day. This, uh, this uh, is a was a, a systematic review was conducted in 2014 by uh, residents of anesthesia of uh, Ains, New Delhi. Uh, the article uh, was uh, titled "Clonidine for Effect for Management of Chronic Pain: A Brief Review of the Current Evidences." So they analyzed uh, approximately the qualitative analysis of approximately uh, of 30 clinical studies were done. Uh, there is an uh, there is evidence that clonidine administered through epidural, intrathecal, and local or topical route uh, may be effective in chronic pain conditions where neuropathy is a predominant component, and it also may be effective where opioids are of limited use due to inadequate pain relief or adverse effects. The other drugs used, and the other drug use is baclofen. Baclofen is used when there is pain related to spasticity. It is an uh, how does it work? It is an agonist of the neurotransmitter GABA. It inhibits the release of excitatory neurotransmitters, principally at the spinal level and at supraspinal sites, thereby decreasing the spasms in the skeletal muscles. So the commercially available concentrations are 50, 500, 1000, 2000 micrograms per ml. The undesirable side effects include sedation, drowsiness, hypotonia, respiratory depression, coma, seizures, and IT, intrathecal baclofen withdrawal syndrome in doses more than 1500 micrograms per day. 
Now, an expert panel cons uh, was consulted. Uh, expert panel consulted on best practices for intrathecal baclofen therapy, the dosing and long-term management. The panel recommended uh, initiating therapy using 500 using the 500 micrograms per ml concentration. Now, the st starting daily dose would be twice the effective bolus dose found during their ITB screening test. Screening test is first done. If the duration of action is more hour, uh, is more than eight hours, or there are negative reactions, then the starting dose should be used uh, would be the same as the screening dose. Example: 50 micrograms the intrathecal baclofen bolus during the screening test. So uh, would give you a would give you a fifth, uh, 100 micrograms per day starting dose. What about the dose dosage titration? Daily dose increases of 5% to 15% once every 24 hours for cerebral origin spasticity and 10 to 30% uh, daily dose increments once every 24 hours for spinal origin spasticity. Uh, this is the uh, uh, this is a figure which is given in the article which I've mentioned. Now, th which describes the various dosages for certain conditions such as brain injury, cerebral palsy, multiple sclerosis, spinal cord injury, and stroke. Now, uh, as we can see, the median daily dose would be uh, they are approximately they fall all under 500 micrograms per day, and the mean. The mean daily dose also is approximately, they all fall below the 500 micrograms per day. Now the box would be the interquartile uh, range. Uh, then uh, the minimum to maximum dosages, they have all been described here. So ITB dosing by indication, uh, the box will span the interquartile range. The whiskers will extend up to the maximum. So the maximum doses would, it's more than, uh, in case of spinal cord injury and brain injury, it's more than 1500 micrograms per day, but it's generally avoided because while stopping, it can lead to uh, intrathecal baclofen withdrawal syndrome. And uh, as I've mentioned, the mean daily dose is denoted with the diamond. The patients and caregivers should understand the care plan responsible, responsibilities and possible side effects uh, before starting the uh, intrathecal baclofen therapy. Now, uh, coming to a newer drug, which is uh, zyconotide. Zyconotide is a, is a newer toxin which has been uh, which has been uh, extrapolated from uh, one device, uh, one uh, species of a snail. Uh, it is the only US FDA approved intrathecal drug uh, apart from morphine. So zyconitine is a non-opioid analgesic, which is used for intrathecal administration. Uh, it is a N-type calcium channel blocker at the presynaptic level. So it prevents a calcium influx, thereby, uh, thereby preventing the release of excitatory neurotransmitters, such as substance P, glutamate, aspartic, etc. So the expert consensus on uh, intrathecal uh, continuous infusion with zyconotide, it suggests a starting dose of 0.5 to 1.2 micrograms per day, followed by a dose titration of less than 0.5 micrograms per day on no more than a weekly basis, according to the individual patient's uh, pain reductions and regimen tolerability. This... Uh, this has been, uh, this I've taken from the Indian Journal of Anesthesia and Uraxial Techniques for Labor of Labor Analgesia for epidural dosages of various uh, opioids. And this is a, uh, this another table I've taken from uh, the Canadian Journal of Anesthesia uh, for the common medications for intrathecal use. Here we can see opioid use, uh, opioid, the opioids use are morphine, hydromorphone, fentanyl, cisentinel. The recommended starting dose, doses are given and the maximum daily dose. Here, the entire calcium channel blocker, zyconotide, uh, the recommended starting dose and the maximum daily dose which can be given is 19.2 micrograms. Bupivacaine uh, recommended starting dose is uh, 0 0.0124 to 4 mg uh, per day. Maximum daily dose is 15 to 20 mg. Then uh, alpha 2 adrenergic agonist that we've discussed clonidine. The recommended starting dose is 20 to 100 micrograms per day, and the maximum daily dose, which can be given, is 600 micrograms per day. Uh, 
coming to the drug related undesirable effects okay so we have uh, early onset uh, early onset and or after right after titration so uh, as we can see for opiates we have diarrhea uh, diarrhea nausea vomiting pruritus uh, etc the late onset we have uh, for opiates catheter tip granulomas uh, decreased libido and then uh, growth hormone deficiency edema immunomodulation etc the non drug complications include uh, due to traumatic catheter placement we have csf leakage headache it is seen in 25% of intrathecal uh, administration so we can have epidural hematoma neurological tissue and damage now uh, infection complications may occur exit site infections which con uh, which constitute about less than 6% uh, epidural abscess meningitis etc and the complications uh, and the device related complications that accounts for about 8 to 25 27% example catheter related that is uh, very common fracture kinking displacement withdrawal or the pump failure uh, and the rates of propensity to human error vary between the root placement and delivery device considerations so uh, drugs delivered via it or ed space are, uh, uh, to the IT or ED space, uh, they are done by a small indwelling catheter. The tube is generally tunneled subcutaneously to emerge at a distant site to reduce the risk of displacement and infection. Now, the devices vary in allowing fixed versus variable delivery rates, patient control boluses, and costs. And the preferred route and delivery device is influenced by local experience and the duration of use. So there are three options for neuraxial analgesia infusions. We have the percutaneous short-term uh, epidural or intrathecal catheter, which is connected to an external pump. Then we have the subcutaneous intrathecal catheter and injection port, which is connected to an external pump. And last, we have the intrathecal drug delivery system. So uh, how do we choose these devices? If, uh, if we can uh, predict that the likely duration of use is less than three weeks, then we, we, must, we should prefer an external epidural device, which is reusable. It is associated with fewer initial complications and that of intrathecal administration. There's less headache from CSF leakage. If the likely duration of use is three weeks to three months, then we can use an external intrathecal device. And there are, again, fewer, uh, fewer later complications than epidural and less catheter occlusion. If uh, the duration of use is, uh, uh, will be more than three months, three to six months, then it is preferred that we use an implantable intrathecal device. It is expensive, yes, uh, but it has a lower running cost and is more cost uh, effective in the long term. This is an intrathecal drug delivery system. The, the first uh, figure is the implantable uh, uh, implantable device uh, so uh, this is done surgically now this I IDDS consists of an implantable pump and an intrathecal catheter it can deliver analgesia with either a fixed rate or programmable uh, or a programmable delivery schedule uh, the main advantage uh, apart from the ones which I've just said uh, would be the adaptability the patient can uh, would be able to continue uh, to will be able to move in the final days of so to summarize, we have learned the indications and contraindications of starting infusions in palliative care settings. Uh, we have now we uh, have now a general idea about the drug compatibilities uh, and then drug interactions. It is vital to uh, empower the patient and uh, and more importantly the caregivers uh, while uh, when we start uh, infusions, especially that of subcutaneous infusions. Then. Uh, we, we, we now have an idea about the different devices and the choice of devices and drugs for neuraxial analgesia. Thank you. These are the, uh... So thank you, Vasi. Thank you for <coughs> overall excellent overview. So before Balbir uh, see the question, if there are any chat box, I want to have a few comments that uh, now, this is for sure that when pain is intractable, we have to find out some other way where we can give rapid relief. And IV is most commonly used, but subcutaneous is equally good with, you have already said, with the this is evidence-based. Uh, this is also evidence-based that if 
if a person has some few days or in the terminal stage of the disease uh and if we empower the family member whatever way if you are you have syringe driver it's fine otherwise in our setup uh because there are so many patients we are also giving disposable elastomeric pump from baxter uh the only disadvantage that it is fixed dose pump but uh, pa patients and their relatives they are managing excellently well and uh, the, it will it lasts for 7 days uh, and uh, after 7 days if patient is alive they come back and we refill the uh, elastomeric pump so this is an another way and one more important thing which i want to highlight is uh, that uh, we have published uh, a series of 20 patients of intrathecal implant uh, which i don't know why they forgot washi and balbir uh, and few papers on intrathecal implants so uh, in this series i uh, what i have realized that it is an excellent way of uh, giving or administering drugs to a patient where we can uh, we can avoid unnecessary side effects of oral morphine like uh, most of the patient we have given morphine with some kind of an adjuvant if patient pain is intractable and we can almost 300 times less morphine was required in these patients so it was an excellent way but it was uh, out of 20 patients i think four patients were having all sorts of complication like seroma infection uh, uh, wound exposure and uh, one patient we have to remove the implant also so uh, and one the biggest thing was with the intrathecal implant was that it was very very expensive so we have to be very very selective so there are other ways like subcutaneous tunneling and all i, I think we can adopt that if patient is terminal and we know that uh, uh, we know that uh, time is limited we can adopt other way but uh, this this modality is also very very uh, very useful in especially in intractable pain in last stage of the diseases so uh, these are the few comments i wanted to give now uh, anyone wants to say anything we have 10 minutes yeah. balbir you have you seen any comments or you want to say something uh, uh, ma'am about uh, intrathecal pump yes we have added uh, just one slide in the last uh, although because it's uh, this topic covering whole uh, sub, uh, large of the um, um, wide the things so we try to limit it in uh, one slide and uh, about uh, yes ma'am it's very true that uh, we use uh, elastomeric pump for uh, epidural infusion and they work very good uh, uh, there was one patient in our uh, setup uh, in nci which we managed with the elastomeric pump because her pain was very intractable so earlier she frequently come to our uh, uh, hospital for admission but uh, when we uh, installed uh, in, uh, elastomeric pump the patient prefer to stay at home and uh, at uh, in the final days uh, she uh, died at their home so it's very important if we properly control the pain it can also change the place of uh, death of the person so i can see dr nandini has given a very good comment that subcutaneous is better than iv this basic is absolutely okay. right that we can give at yeah. multiple nandini can you open your mic and say no actually sushma thank you um, my comment was that suppose we have to give intermittent drugs uh, subcutaneously there are no iv lines and also if there is an infusion in, in the subcut line going on we may have to take more than one subcut line because the drug may get diluted in the subcut uh, you know that uh, of the infusion and it it won't get uh, the action won't come early that was what my comment was if it's not clear i'm sorry uh ma'am uh, in this regard washi has also uh, already told uh, that uh, once uh, one subcutaneous infusion is going on when we start it uh, just uh, in order to control the breakthrough symptoms uh, uh, in the initial hours we can use other routes to overcome the symptoms for initial 4 to 5 hours because uh, the uh, drug, uh, actually, the level of drug uh, reaches its peak in 4 to 5 hours by subcutaneous routes so we can uh, try other routes at that time thank you very very important point to highlight dr stanley you want to say something yes uh, sushma thank you thank you for that nice coverage of a uh, very important topic because lot of our patients when they cannot swallow this is the way we have to keep them comfortable uh, only thing is about uh, syringe driver 
the use of it in our home care situation you know um, one thing is what is the cost of it you know the second thing is uh, the technical empowerment of the family is not easy and we don't have that kind of backup in our country so uh, i have worked in the uk and I've done this kind of constant uh, you know um, continuous infusion but then uh, i realized that it is not very practical in our country and that's why we started doing what we call the regular intermittent uh, subcut uh, um, uh, injections of the same combination same combination that is used on a syringe driver same thing is used and you know the family easily there are two three members of the family they can easily uh, make that four hourly schedule and they can give it very regularly and also in between as needed and we have found that you know the patient uh, the therapeutic range is maintained just like the oral method of four hourly the only thing is you are giving it subcut subcutaneously which is a better way of giving and uh, and the patient is comfortable so at the fraction of the cost we are achieving that you know and a lot of it is written up in our uh, you know journal in indian journal of palliative care it's also written up in our the textbook that we have for uh, people you know who are doing the course eight weeks course essentials so i think we, this is something we should really look into because it is very relevant for our country situation and i would say maybe you should take up a nice uh, what do you call comparison study you know between uh, continuous infusion and intermittent uh, this thing and look into all aspects of it so i would really say that that be a wonderful study for for us, not only us but for the rest of the world also thank you sir uh, oh, and the most, yeah, most of yeah, the data yeah. which, uh, which we have took it's uh, from uk study only there was uh, no study we found uh, from our, our setup in uh, for uh, as far as continuous infusion subcutaneous continuous infusion is concerned yeah yeah uh, no, what i'm saying is in the uk it is continuous infusion and what i'm saying is having done that for 6 months or even a year year and a half that i have worked as a consultant there yes uh i i come back here and i do just the opposite just a different method yes, yes, what yes. i'm saying is it is very uh, doable it is very practical <coughs> in our country that's what i'm saying Because i just patient... want to say one thing last comment that uh, although you said that uh, sub, uh, intermittent subcutaneous infusion is the way and it's very simple very easy for our patient but our experience says that even if a patient is illiterate <laughs> and even if a patient is uh, very like fifth or sixth class pass and if you empower them they use these pumps so well because ultimately they are their loved ones so they become the scientists of the using of that pump so it is not that uk or india it is the how much we are explaining to our patient and how much we are empowering to the patient this is our experience because not a single patient whom we have given pump whether elastomeric or syringe driver we have not found anything like they have not understood that they have misused yes this is definitely there that if these pumps are not available subcutaneous intermittent infusion will be a better option but people are intelligent even in uk and even in india they understand and they do very well they do very well sometimes they ask so tricky questions before leaving that you also get uh, shocked that this i have never thought that this query can come from the patient so i think i was just thinking on the way while they were preparing the lecture that iapc will do this exercise first this uh, comparing two methods from various centers and also making a uniform protocol and uh, uh, the, the and uh, frequently asked questions from the patient which we have encountered i think we have almost we remember everybody remember those question so we will find a we will just memorize those questions and we will make a good document i think balveer and washi they can take the lead with few other md students from tmh and uh, uh, gcri and uh, mm-hmm. now manipal and uh, all these students so i think balveer you can lead this project with all document. the students from all over country and make yes, this a, a good document for iapc so that it will always remain on iapc website Okay, ma'am. Thank you. So we have only two minutes. Is there any other comment? Yeah, that's the question. Now, then that, I, yeah, please. That kind of study will be really very, very good. I think we should do. Yeah, that. yeah, we'll do it. Yeah. We'll do it. We'll do it. 
so i have one two announcement that uh, the next lecture will be the last lecture of this series uh, by anuja damani and her, her team and uh, after that there will be a series which is very very important and i think we should not miss definitely we should not miss this series that will be series 5 and uh, you will find this lecture of the title of those lectures of lecture series 4 5 on the uh, today's iepc newsletter so please see the newsletter carefully and you will have an idea you will get an idea and you will start planning your next 6 uh, 7 weeks uh, beforehand because this is so important the lecture series 5 second thing i just want to announce because there are so many people on the, uh, the there that uh, iepc has announced a uh, scholarship for the people those who are Uh, who will present their abstract in uh, bangalore conference and uh, and the abstract should be of a highest standard so 10 best abstracts will get the prize of uh, a tune of uh, 10000 rupees so i think 10000 rupees are enough for to, to travel by plane uh, from anywhere in india to bangalore so iepc is going to give 10000 to each student or each presenter who will present and the 10 best abstracts if they will come amongst 10 best so please start preparing your abstract and be a scholarship holder or a award holder yes doctor yes doctor still yeah. please go yeah, ahead just one more question this will be the last the cost yeah. of the uh, you know syringe driver in india just now and also the other one the elasto uh, pump you know what is the cost of these two elastomeric pump is 1200 rupees yes Sometimes if they give also in eleven hundred, and sometimes if we say the patient is very poor, they also give in eight hundred or seven hundred. Okay. And But definitely in this document we will do every the, all this exercise, and we will find we will come out with this exercise. Syringe driver. Okay. Syringe driver cost. Syringe driver. I don't know. I don't know. Okay. Thank so I think uh, we can we can work on it. We can work on it sure, in sure. the in the next to this thing. Sure. Sure. so thank you very much and now be prepared for the next series of lecture before this uh, this is second last lecture and please join on this last lecture of this lecture series 4 uh, by dr anuja damani and her team so thank you very much probably by kmc manipal navin and her team so thank you archana and nisha and uh, for keeping uh, all of us on track and she has reminded me to announce all these uh, important announcement before closing thanks a lot thank you thank you ma'am Thank you everyone thank you thank you washi and balbir thank you ma'am thank you sir